So Josh asked me to preach um, on this morning. Can you hear me? I'm not very good with microphones, but can you hear me? Direct me. Josh asked me a months and months ago um, if I'd preach on this morning. And, and as soon as he asked me to preach, um, his words were, just whatever prophetically you feel, Catherine, you can just preach on anything, which I thought was a little bit dangerous. Um, but as soon as he said that, I heard in the spirit the sound of a trumpet. And it's the trumpet that heralds. It's the trumpet that, you know, heralds the Queen coming into Westminster Abbey. It's the, the trumpet that heralds the entry of a bride. It's the sort of trumpet, I don't know if this is true, but in the movies, it's the sort of trumpet that starts the beginning of a battle. It heralds a movement. It heralds a change. And I went, oh, God, what, what are you saying? What are you saying? And I just felt him say that there's a change of season coming for us as a church from a time of being static, from a time of pain, for a time of almost stillness, to a time of action. And that that trumpet call is, is almost God clapping his hands and saying, come on church, stand to attention, get ready, we're ready to move. And he took me to my team will groan at this, my ladies' team, because I am forever in Esther. I love the book of Esther. I adore the book of Esther. I am forever quoting either Jeremiah 29 or Esther at them. But uh, this is, you know, and I, kept, I was like, oh God, it can't be Esther again. But he took me to Esther and he kept me in Esther. And Esther 4.14 is the scripture I'm basing today on. For if you remain silent at this time... Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And I think most of us know the story of Esther, the story of a young orphan girl who was a Hebrew girl who was in exile. And um, she, was, she was at that time the lowest of the low. She was an orphan. She was a female um, and she was in exile. And God, through a series of, of events, moved her so that she ended up becoming queen. And she was in position to be the salvation of her nation. I think that's why I love it, because so many of us come from places that we felt crushed, that we felt downtrodden, that, you know, we've carried pain. And yet God's prayer for us, God's destiny, God's desire for us is to put us in a place where we will see salvation come to our communities, to our towns, to our cities. And I just, if we are going to see the prophetic call of God accomplished over this church, if we are going to see us become a church that is a voice in the nation, that is going to become a resource, um, a, a, a hub for the nation, then we need to stand up and each take our part. I can say this because Clive and Karen and Josh aren't here, but they are awesome, incredible, and amazing people and we are so privileged to have them in our midst but they can't do it all we've got to stand up we've got to stand up and take our bit and do our bit and I believe that that is what God is wanting to challenge us today and I just want to concentrate on two little bits of that phrase it, to start with if you stay silent if you stay silent and I just would like to ask you the question is there something that keeps you silent? What is your if? Is there an if in your life that just keeps you from, from speaking out? From being the person that will stand in the office and go, I don't like that language. I don't like that calendar. Can you take it down? Who will stand there when your neighbor is having her heart broken because she's had a miscarriage or a divorce and you go, can I pray for you? And it's scary, it's scary. I'm rubbish at doing that, really rubbish, because it's scary. What's our if? And there are three things that I just felt the Lord wanted to highlight to us. Sorry, I've got to have a drink. And the first is a time of battering. When we've been in a time of battering or a time of pain, it can make us silent. I call it the hedgehog syndrome. It's, you go like that. You know, when you've been really hurt, um, something's come at you, or you're in a painful season, you kind of don't want to communicate with other people, do you? You kind of want to go in, have all the prickles up around you that will keep people away, and you stay silent. And we found this, didn't we, babe? 
as a lot of you know, nearly two years, exactly two years ago, Paul's um, brother committed suicide. It was an absolutely devastating time in our lives, not only because we'd lost a brother, but because of the repercussions of that suicide in the family. He, um, his wife had died of cancer 10 years before, so he left two children the same age as us. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't expect that to happen. Um, orphaned, they were orphaned at the age of 25 and 22, they became orphans. And there were repercussions in David's business life that we had no idea about that were devastating. They were humiliating, to be honest, to be part of a family where somebody had done that. It devastated us as a family. And it made us silent. Our home is not a silent place. It is normally full of people, full of animals. We are very opinionated people as a family. So there's always some discussion, sometimes quite loud discussions going on. And it silenced us. We stopped playing music. Paul and Claire love to worship. They have got beautiful voices. And music is normally always playing in our home. And we stopped it. Because it was too painful. Because when you went into that worship place, that throne room of God, it was too painful. We stopped watching the telly. Because the news was too graphic. And to be honest, most of the dramas that were on telly were too abusive almost, coming at us. We became silent. The silence in our house was almost deafening. And, and we, we couldn't cope with people. We were like, oh God, don't let anybody come to our door. We couldn't cope with coming to church. We isolated ourselves and it silenced our voices. And yet in that time, when we came to the end of ourselves, we found that we hadn't come to the end of God. And God started to take us through an, a, a time of deep restoration and deep change in our lives. And the breakthrough, it, it, it's come gradually. It's, it's still a work in progress. But Clive's second or third Sunday, never met us before. He comes up to Paul and goes, I take shock and trauma off your life in Jesus' name. And breakthrough started to come. And when we thought we would never feel normal again, where we would never laugh again, where, where noise our voice would never come back. It started to come back. Has there been something in your life that has silenced you? Something down the years that has silenced you? Well, don't be discouraged because in those times of battling, those times of being silent, there's also a time of opportunity. We love going to Italy. We love our holidays in Italy. But there are, you know, very regularly, there are forest fires. And we will sit in our, normally by our pool, watching a forest fire unfold in front of us. And one year this happened, didn't it? A couple of years ago. And we thought, oh, well, we'll go up and see what's happened. There was such a scar on the landscape. So Paul and I drove up um, to the, you know, to where this fire had been. And we saw that although it was black, there were lots of little new shoots coming up, little new bits of growth coming up. And I know that there are, there are um, seeds in places like Australia that only come out. They're plants that can only germinate when the, se the seed cases have been through a, f a hot, hot, hot fire. And that breaks open the seed case and new things come, come out. And I just felt that this morning that there were, the Lord wanted to encourage us that there are times of opportunity, there are new things, and that some of you even have been going on this path, and God's saying, no, you're going through the fire because I want you on this path. I want this new thing to come forth in your lives. So a time of battling, a time of pain can lead to a time of opportunity. Another thing that will silence our voices is intimidation because intimidation robs you of your identity intimidation comes against who you are and who you were created to be and that intimidation can be as a child being bullied at school because you didn't look right or you didn't do the right thing you didn't say the right thing it comes it's evil it's wicked it comes against our identity even as adults you know maybe we feel gossiped about gossip is Vile, 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 because it, our words are creative. You know, I'm so careful these days about how I speak about Helen. People will say, how's she doing? And I'll go, she's amazing. She's got a grace upon her. She's at peace. Medically, it's not good. 
but we dare to hope. Because I think I am not going to speak death over Helen. Because until she has, for the whole time that she's got breath in her body, whether that's for two weeks, two years, or 200 years, I am going to fight for that. And I'm going to stand because every morning she gets up and she chooses life. She says, God, let your will be done in my life, but I choose life. And the wo our words are creative. God created the world by speaking. So why would we be any different? When we speak, we create. And we create good and we create evil. And it's so important about how we speak about others, how we speak about situations. I love the fact that Bob will say, God is good all the time, even when we don't understand it. He's not blaming God. He's just going, God, I don't understand this time of fire that we're going through, but I know that you're good. I wasn't going to say that, so I've lost my train now. <laughs> Yeah, robs us of our identity. I was, one of my guilty pleasures is to sit in bed before I go to sleep and watch little clips of this morning with Phil and Holly. I love it. And um, there, was a, <laughs> there was a clip on there recently of a young boy, 18 years old, and he had been so badly bullied at school that he hid. His mother had phoned up. It was a bullying um, hotline. And she phoned up because she was so concerned about her son because he had become silent. He shut himself in his room and he only came out at night when she was sleeping because he couldn't bear any contact. He couldn't bear to be anybody, even his mother, to see him. And it was quite amazing because he agreed to speak to the presenters. And one of them started to say, well, if you're at home, you must watch a lot of telly. And the boy went, yeah. And uh, he said, well, if you watch a lot of telly, would you like to see how telly's made? And the boy went, yeah. So Phil said, well, what's your favorite program? And he goes, Doctor Who. So he goes, OK. He goes, why don't you come to our studio and watch our program being made? And we'll speak to the BBC and see if you can go and watch Doctor Who being made. And this boy went, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Mother was in tears. But it's what God does for us. He comes and finds us in our darkest place. And he puts his hand out and says, come on, come and watch the program being made. Come stand by me because it's safe. And that was the thing about this. It was a safe place. Going into the studio with public figures, it was actually a safe place. It was promised to be safe. He promised to be looked after. God does that for us. He knows every hair on our head. He holds us in the palm of our hands. Why would he put us in damaging situations? He just wants to draw us out. Draw us out from those places of intimidation and be healed and restored. And in order to stand in our identity with God, we need to do that. And I, I, the thing I love about the story of Esther is that I kind of, there's a lot, a friend of mine at work um, said, you know, there's an awful lot that isn't said in the Bible. You kind of almost sometimes get headlines, don't you? Esther was this, she got adopted, she's in the palace. But what you don't get is what she must have gone through. The healing, Mordecai adopted her. He gave her an identity. It says he adopted her as his daughter. In those days, unheard of to adopt a woman, a female. He would have adopted a son, but not a daughter. And he stood out in his generation and adopted a daughter, gave her an identity, put her feet on the rock. And I like to think that Mordecai steered her and guided her and, he, and, and took her to a place where she could have healing. Because when she was taken into the palace, she almost immediately got favor with the eunuchs. Now, if she was full of bitterness and full of pain and full of rejection or was downcast, however beautiful she was, she wouldn't have found favor. Because she ha it's that radiance of God that actually the presence of God she carried that found favor. And if you, you know, we have to allow the presence of God to fill our lives. And if we've got our lives full of pain and hurt and bitterness and rejection and all the rest of the things, there's not a lot of room in there for God. And so we won't radiate God. And it's one of the things that I just think God really wants to touch in our lives today is come on, come on church, shake it off. We're so privileged with having Clive as our pastor who knows how to minister, who knows how to train. Those that have done wholeness 
ministering to wholeness one. It's been just incredible. And he's training an army to be able to go out and heal the army. And we need, to take, we need to be the forerunners of that church. We need to get hold of that which God wants to get hold of us and go, you know what, God, I can't step out. I can't do that. And for me, I, I just felt I had to share this testimony that I was brought up in Africa as a very small child. My dad, who was quite an adventurer, really, because I'm talking early 70s, he took my brother and I and my mom um, in an airplane, never been in one before, across to West Africa. I, I, seriously, I know it's, it's so normal for us to nip off here and nip off there and jump on a plane, but in those days, it was unheard of. And to go to West Africa, where, honestly, my granny thought we were going to get cannibalized, and, I mean, so wrong. But, you know, that is actually the, the prejudice and the, and the view, isn't it, of, of, of that time. And we went, and I had an awesome childhood. I loved my childhood. I don't have any memories of England as a small child. My memories are of Africa. And we came back when I was sort of needing to go to secondary school, and oh my goodness, what a culture shock. I had to wear shoes and socks. It was cold, and it was stiff and formal. And I, I didn't get it. And I, I had thrived at school in Africa because it had been a, um, a, um, an independent, multicultural school um, and very forward-thinking um, forefront thinking teacher. We had an amazing education. So I went from a place where I was top of the class, I thrived, I was like, you know, the bee's knees there. And I was put into a very lovely school, but it was a, an English private school for girls. St. Albans High School for girls. And it was a gals, it was gals. And it was lovely. It was, you know, the best education my parents could give me. The head, headmaster, headmistress, sorry, was a Christian. The school's motto is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What an amazing motto to be educated under. And um, every day we had to have um, assembly. And she had us, the, the um, headmistress, had us read from the Bible every single day. And it fell to the sixth form, sixth formers, to do this, to stand and read. And because I'd come from a very um, free place to not feeling like I fit, I fit in, um, I had no confidence. I had milk bottle thick glasses. I had hair that I tried to cover my face with as much as possible so I could hide. I had no confidence. I'm also dyslexic. So to stand up in front of a school of 600 girls and read from the Bible, which was very old-fashioned English, it was all these and nows and long names that I couldn't read, couldn't pronounce, was awful. And I, I, I managed to duck out of it a few times by pretending to throw up and things, but the day came that I had, I had to do it. It was like, I couldn't back out of it anymore. And I stood there, and I can remember it to this day. I stood there with a Bible. I had no control over my body. It shook from head to toe. My knees, you know, people say that knees knock. They knocked. Everybody could hear my knees knocking. I, could, I couldn't control them. I just couldn't. I couldn't control the shaking. The girls in the balcony at the top went afterwards went, oh, we could hear you. We could see you shaking. You were shaking like a leaf. I was like, I know I was. But what happened that day? It shut me down. It shut me down. And I swore I would never, ever stand on a platform in front of people. Even this morning, I've had to fight that intimidation. And yet I know there's a call in my life to preach the word of God. And I've had to fight that because the call of God and my reality don't match up. I've been intimidated by my reality. And I've had to stand and go, no, God, I am going to battle through this. I am. I, and it, it, even we were driving down. I was like, we could just drive past the turning to church. It would be fine. We could just go hide. And Paul was like, no. But every morning, every time I'm, I'm asked, and actually I don't, I got to the stage where I was like, God, I hate this. I know it's the call, but I don't like it. So I'm never going to seek it. I will only do this if you ask me. So I know that I know that I know that it's from you so that when the intimidation comes, I can go, no, no enemy. No, I'm not going to listen to that. And even when Josh asked me, I said, oh yeah, I'll do it, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not all clever like you. It won't be all, you know, smart. And, and it, the Holy Spirit went to me, what are you saying? And I was like, yeah, but you know, Josh refers to um, philosophers and he's incredible. And, you know, one of his preachers keeps me going for weeks, you know, challenging me. My reference 
is the Lion King. Me, I just think, you know, put Hakuna Matata, you know, look at the devil and go, I'll pinch it again. I mean, that's, that's good, isn't it? That, that's my reference in life, is, the, is Disney films. That's, that's about it. But then, you know, oh, the Holy Spirit really told me off and said, you're part of a body. You know, the hand can't do what the foot does. We've heard that a lot. You know, we, we all know it, don't we? But sometimes we, when it's us, when it's us being intimidated, we lose that. So whatever is intimidating you, whatever has come against you, whatever has silenced your voice, even... Um, with the school time, one of the things that I could do when I came back to England was to speak French. Because, again, mum and dad were like, give us every opportunity, get us out there learning French. But we didn't learn it in a classroom. We learned it just by talking and playing. And, and so by the age of eight, I, was, I wasn't fluent, but I could really get by with French. And I went into a classroom where we all sat in rows and I had to do French grammar. And it closed my voice. And to this day, I still can't speak French. We stopped on, in France on, on holiday, and Paul was like... Blah, 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 blah. I knew exactly what he was saying. I could understand it, but I could not have spoken it. And so when God started to lay on my heart to learn Italian, because there's a call on us for Italy, I was like, no, God, I'm blonde, I'm menopausal, I'm dyslexic, they're all things against me, I'm not languages, I can't do French, I, you know, I just can't do it. And I fought for a year with him. I was so afraid of being intimidated, of being made to feel silly, uh, you know, in a class. And uh, in the end, I plucked up courage and I started to learn Italian. And I had to look intimidation in the face when I went to Italy this year with Rachel. And I stood in front of a church of 150 people and I introduced myself in Italian. And they understood. But it's, you have to, sometimes it's a battle. It's not something, intimidation is something that can come against us again and again and again. It's not something that we can just... God pray, you know, we, we get prayed for and it goes. Sometimes it does, but there's also a time that we daily have to battle it. And God would say to you this morning, if you're battling intimidation, do not be discouraged. Do not be discouraged because I have a plan for you. A plan to give you a hope and a future. And whatever that plan is, his word will not return void. So if you know that you've got a call on you to do something that terrifies you, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid because God is there to give you what, he need, what you need. And we have the Holy Spirit with us to look at the enemy and go, no further. Mm. Going through places of pain and intimidation can mean that we lose our confidence. And actually not being confident, it's a little bit the same as the other two, but it can help us lose our voice and we need to have our foundations in God correctly because if our foundations and our feet are on that rock if our foundations and our feet are in who we are in God and in Christ we can look at intimidation we can look at pain we can look at bullying and we can see instead of the pain we can see the opportunity and we can become brave Isaiah 43, 1 says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. And church, that's our promise this morning, that whatever is coming has come against you. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you, says God. I have chosen you by name. Clive spoke last week about having works prepared for us, how God has works prepared for us, and that you know, God's return, word does not return to him void. We can walk off our path because we've got free will, but everything works together for the good of those that love him. And we can, even if we feel we've, you know, wandered off the path a bit, and maybe intimidation has come against us because of that, all we have to do is go, God, lead me in your path, because you redeem me and you save me.
knowing who she was made Esther brave. It meant that she could go before the king and speak up for the Jews because she had a deep confidence in the God whom she trusted. And the story of Esther is that there was a, a plot to um, kill the Jews and Mordecai highlighted it to Esther and said, come on, you're in the palace, you can do something about it. And she went, no, it's too dangerous. She was intimidated by her circumstances. She was intimidated by the report of the palace that said, if you go before the king without him asking you to, he will kill you. And that's when Mordecai came back and said, if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you will perish. That's hard. That's a hard thing. And God spoke to me about this, about city ladies, because I've been wondering, do I give it up? Do I not? What do I do? And this was the scripture he, he spoke to me from, and he went, Catherine, if you remain silent, city ladies will be fine, but you won't have stepped into your destiny. It wasn't, I didn't take it like a death threat, but, uh, <laughs> but I knew that if I didn't pick it up, if I didn't be obedient to the call of God, then actually the call of God on my, on my life, it would be, you know, it just wouldn't be fulfilled. And so where is God asking you to be brave today? Where's he asking you to look intimidation in the face and say, I know what the call of God is on my life. I know who I am in Christ, and I may not feel brave, but I am going to be brave. Just, let's pray a moment. Let's just put our hands on our throats, because that's where the voice comes from. And if there's an if in your life that is keeping you silent, just bring it before the Lord now. Father, we come to you because you're our fortress and our deliverer. You're our rock. You're our saviour. You hold us in the palm of your hand. And Father, I just pray for every intimidation for every pain that has kept a voice silent to be gone now in Jesus' name. For your healing balm to come upon each voice, Lord, upon each spirit that has been crushed and bring your release. We call forth life. We call vo forth a voice for every person that feels that they've been overlooked, we call forth that voice. Because Father, you know, the, you know every grain of sand upon the beach, so how much more will you know each one of us? So we call it forth now, in Jesus' name. Amen. So the second part that I just wanted to concentrate on was time. So I've talked about what can silence us, but when we've dealt with what can silence us, how do we know that it's our time to stand up and move into that which God has got for us? Who knows that you came to your royal position for such a time as this? And God prepares us and he places us. And in the placing, he prepares us to position us. So Esther was placed, she was placed in the palace and she was prepared and she became queen so that she was then positioned to be the salvation of her nation. And I think sometimes we get a little bit lost in maybe the preparation and we, we don't realise we're in a time of preparation and we get frustrated that we're not in our time. And she recognised it. There has to come a point where we recognise that that time has come has come about. Esther, um, after this, it's like it wakes her up. It's like that hand clap I was talking, that trumpet call in the middle at the beginning. It's like she suddenly woke up to why she was there. 
And she goes, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to go before the king and if I die, I die. Because she knew that her life was not as important as the call of God. That she had to, she would maybe physically die, but she certainly had to die to self. She had to be, find the brave within to go and stand before the king and plead for her nation. God is a God of history and geography. So it's no mistake that we're in here, whatever the date is today, September 2017. It's no mistake that we're in Hertfordshire in St. Albans today. Because God is a God of history and a God of geography. And I've just lost my... Oh, excuse me, I have lost my scripture, which was awesome. Sorry, I'm just going to find it because I, I have to read this to you. Babe, can you find it for me? It's Acts 26. I think it's Acts 26, 17, but I would just... Um... Oh, I got it. Sorry, Acts 17, 26. <laughs> Mrs. Barker knew better. <laughs> From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. And I think sometimes we just think that we end up where we end up by complete chance. And maybe there are the, well, no, I don't think there is a chance. I think God positions us, places us where he wants us to be. And we can't underestimate the importance of boundaries. Joshua 1 says, I will give you the land where you put your feet. It's the promise of God to us that where we are physically, he will give us our land. It means that you can go into your office and you can take that land because you are light and every knee must bow and every tongue must confess to the name of Jesus. And so we can go into those places, those places that are dark, and we can release light. We can, if, if, you know, if there are things going on in your family that are not good, if there are things come against you as a family, go oil your boundaries. Proclaim that land as the land that only Jesus can walk in. That anything that is the enemy is not allowed. And we, we found this, didn't we, um, years ago when we moved out of St. Albans. We knew that God was calling us to go. We didn't particularly want to go. We'd both been to school here. We'd got married here. We'd grown up here. But we knew that God was moving us on. And we couldn't sell our house. And one Christmas, we were meeting with some friends. And the mother of the friend was there. And she looks at us and she goes, your house, you need to go and you need to separate the boundaries. You need to release it. Because that land isn't yours at the moment. In the spirit, that land isn't yours. And you can't, it's got, there's a legal right on it that you, you can't sell it. She'd never been to our house, never. She didn't know how it looked. And she was absolutely right. Because the house that we owned was built in the 1930s. And the builder who had built the houses had kept the house next door for himself. So he had made every boundary from his house down the left-hand side and every boundary from his house up the right-hand side, so that the boundary going between his house and our house, nobody owned. And there was a dispute on it, and there had been a dispute from as far as we could work out for as long as the houses had been occupied. We couldn't sort it. We came up with all sorts of things. We prayed about the dispute. We couldn't do it. And we couldn't sell our house. So uh, I think it was, near, it was New Year's Day. We, had some, we have a lot of mad friends, and one set in particular came for lunch. And we said, oh, before lunch, do you just feel like oiling the boundaries? Did we feel stupid? Out there in our wellies, in the wet, it was raining and it was horrible and cold. And we got this bottle of oil and we splashed it all around the boundaries. And we separated that land from the builder and from the illegal intent that he'd got, the deception that he'd got, the greed, all those sort of things. Three days later, we sold our house. And then we tried to move. And we ended up feeling very strongly, I won't go into the story now, that we were to live on a, in a, on a particular hill in Kings Langley. We found a house, we made an offer, we were in a fantastic position, they wouldn't accept the offer. We upped the offer, they wouldn't accept the offer, they just wouldn't sell us the house. So in the end, we got the same mad friends back and went, more boundary work to do. <laughs> uh, and we, we couldn't get to all the boundaries, but we kind of did it 
as a symbol and we walked around the house and those boundaries that we could, we stood on the front garden and we went like this. We claim this land for you. We believe that this is the house that you've given us, Lord. So we put our foot on this ground. We will not be terrified. We will not be intimidated by all the new age spirits that are present in Kings Langley. We will not be intimidated and we will live in this house. We buried scripture, didn't we, about possessing the gates of the enemy. Oh, we did everything. <laughs> and about four or five days later, we bought the house. So boundaries are powerful, really powerful. And I just felt as I, you know, to share those stories, to say, go home and oil your boundaries. I know Clive does it here and he marches the boundaries. It's like claim this land for Jesus. Jeremiah 29, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, especially for you, Helen, and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. He positions us for purpose. He positions us geographically and historically. He's positioned us at this time in history to be where we are, to fulfill what God wants. And how do we recognize that our time is our time? And I was talking to a friend and she said, I think it's, it's that sense of frustration. When you're so frustrated with your circumstances, uh, but you're looking at your circumstances thinking, well, this will never change. And it's looking at the circumstances and going, no, I am going to see God redeem this. We, we had it uh, recently, Paul was out of work for a very, very long time, has been out of work. And um, we... We knew that God was in it. We knew he was dealing with our heart. He knew, we knew he was dealing with all sorts, you know, that we had to repent of and all sorts of things. But there came a point when yet another job had literally disappeared into the ether. We were so despondent. I remember phoning Paul when I got to work and saying, I think we have to fight. And he said, yeah. He said, I've been thinking exactly the same thing. It's like this far and no further this far, we draw a line in the sand and we say, enemy, we are not having any more. You've had a legal right. God, it's like the story of Job. The, you know, God allowed the enemy to go in and challenge Job and challenge his heart. And we felt that God had really done that for us. And we'd been praying for a Job restoration. And yet that Job restoration seemed further and further away. And we just thought, no, we've got to start fighting. We are still fighting that. I wouldn't say that we're fully through. He is now working. But, you know, we, we really had to fight that one, didn't we? It's like standing on the top of a diving board and looking down into that. I don't know if ever you have stood on the top, top of a diving board. In the, it is scary. It, I don't know how they do it in the Olympics because actually you could die. You could seriously die. If you jump the wrong way, you would die. So that Esther, if I die, I die. Yeah, you probably would if you dive the wrong way off a, off a, a diving board. And sometimes we can feel that, that we can feel that it, we don't want to jump. We haven't got the courage to jump, but we can. We just need to find that bravery to step out. We need to, Clive was talking about the wheelbarrow and the mountain, wasn't he? And sometimes we just have to keep coming back with our wheelbarrow and shoveling a bit more off that mountain. It's what we did today with Helen. That mountain of cancer hasn't gone, but yet again we've gone with our collective wheelbarrows and we've shoveled away at that mountain of cancer and we've taken a bit more away. And one day that mountain will collapse. We need to get a correct perspective of our circumstances. Are we going to be internally motivated by the faith and the passion that God can put there? Or are we going to be externally manipulated, looking at our circumstances and saying, nothing can change. I don't believe God can move in this. We looked at our circumstances, didn't we? The debt was mounting up. We didn't know how we were going to pay the mortgage. We were literally at our beam's end. And yet we just had to say, God, we trust you. God, we trust you. We're going to look upwards. We're not going to be chickens pecking in the dirt. We're going to soar on eagles' wings, and we're going to get a heavenly perspective. And we know that we know that we know that in the midst of this fire, in the midst of this trouble, in the midst of this trial, you are at work in our hearts. And that you, what you have promised, which 
for us was that we would always be in a place of plenty. That's the promise that we have, and we're holding on to that. We haven't seen it yet, but we're holding on to it because that's the promise of God. And we might feel that in the midst of it, we're dying, but God is there to restore us and redeem us. Because there's that pull, there's that pull, even in, even in the depths of when David had died, we couldn't turn away from God because we knew that God was our life source. Even what you were talking about today was so pertinent, where sometimes God is behind us, protecting us. We can't see him, we can't feel him, we can't touch him, we can't, you know, we can't almost sense him because he's busy behind us, protecting us. And there's that draw on us, that draw, that destiny call that's calling, come on. What, what were you created to do? Were you called to be Daniel's or Joseph's or Esther's or Deborah's? They all stood up. They all moved. And it's time, church, that we moved, that we took hold of that which God has got hold of us for, that we believe that what God has said to us will come about. When Jesus had been pre preaching particularly tough stuff, a load of his followers just went, whoa, this is too hard. This is way too hard. And they left. And he looked at his 12 disciples and went, are you going to go as well? And they went, Lord, to whom shall we go? They knew that the source of life was Jesus, that there was something about Jesus and their destiny that meant that they couldn't leave. They couldn't walk away from Jesus, even though what he was saying was tough, even though what he was saying was going to change their lives and challenging every single part of their lives, every belief system they had, every um, hope and dream they had, they were having to give it to Jesus. They knew they couldn't walk away. How powerful would we be as a church if that's the way that we operated? And I think that's a challenge. It's a hard challenge, but it's a challenge. That there's a call, a destiny call on this church to stand and be a voice in this nation. And that voice is made up of each one of us. None of us are excluded. None of us is unworthy. Whatever has gone on before, every single one of us has a part. And actually, if we don't, if we don't all stand up, then that voice won't be complete. You know, the worship, amazing. But if we didn't have the bass or we didn't have the drums, it wouldn't sound quite as good. And it's the same for us as a church. We all need to stand and go, yes, Jesus. Yes, I am going to be brave. I'm going to look intimidation in the face and know that you came to save me from that and heal me.